Good afternoon and welcome to Office Hours. So glad to have uh, the crew that's here, our, our regular uh, stalwarts of the Office Hours crew, but also for those that are watching this afterwards, thanks so much for tuning in and being part of this. Uh, with us today is Meredith Johnson, who I had the privilege of meeting at CNU in Charlotte, the Congress of the New Urbanism. And we connected and we started talking and she's, I said, what do you do? And she said, I work in especially heritage preservation or planning or historical helping places uh, register and create policies for their historical places. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And it is one of those things that from a strong town's perspective, we actually kind of hint at often of, of the need to really understand the, the core features of, of our traditional development pattern and the way in which communities were able to evolve and, and adapt to ex, ad, existing needs and, and continue to respond in, in all sorts of ways that were very uh, sort of bottom up and, and allowing for those things to happen. And, and that there are forces within sort of the heritage preservation world that can be really powerful and really, really healthy, but there can also be the temptations that come in uh, to sort of let everything be frozen, uh, that everything becomes a museum piece, even entire downtowns in certain places like Charleston that, that are, are accorded a certain status and, as Chuck would say, are forced to live in perpetual adolescence because they're not permitted uh, to evolve and emerge and, and to become something more. On the other hand, we have so little across North America of like great historical spaces that it raises the question, how do we account for those artifacts of various settlement patterns over, over millennia uh, that mark our territories that we live in, as well as being respectful of the places and creating a deep sense of a love of our place uh, because uh, we know more of its story and we know more of the things that remind us that we're not the first people that have showed up here and made our claim. And so in this setting, uh, Meredith is a preservation planner at Johnson Planning and Preservation down in Austin, Texas. And uh, we, like I said, we we met, I said, oh, I need to have you on office hours and to talk about it. And so uh, welcome, Meredith. Why don't you just briefly uh, share a little bit more about how you got into this and sort of how heritage is maybe an element of, of your broader practice? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that fabulous overview. Um, preservation is really complex, as you just laid out. And um, I'm hoping we can talk about those complexities in a little bit of detail. Um, so my background is, I always say, first in planning. My undergraduate degree was in urban planning from Texas State University. I'm a Texas gal. Um, and so, but I immediately left. Um, I really wanted to try planning in somewhere that seemed you know, open to planning. Um, so I left immediately and went to Seattle um, and really learned a lot, um, worked on micro housing, which doesn't seem related to preservation, but hopefully we can make that connection in a minute, um, but worked on some really interesting policies and then came back um, and started working with smaller towns in central Texas. And that's really, I say, where I not only cut my teeth as a planner, but also really piqued my interest in historic preservation. So after that, I left again, escaped Texas again, um, and went and got my master's degree um, at the University of Pennsylvania up in Philadelphia, which if you haven't been to Philadelphia, I really strongly recommend it if you're a fan of history, of architecture, of seeing how cities have evolved around history and the architecture. I think Philly is a wonderful place to test your eyes and kind of see what's around. Um, I started my private practice um, a couple years after graduating from my master's program, after I did some really on the ground corridor work, working with um, businesses in historic um, buildings, tenants of historic buildings who wanted to renovate. So really specifically getting into that niche of, we don't have a lot of money, but we're required to do this thing. How do we do that? Um, and from there, I launched my business, um, Johnson Planning and Preservation, and moved it to Central Texas, where I felt the need was very strong. So that's in a nutshell. Um, very specifically, my work today is predominantly with rural or smaller jurisdictions. You know, we try to get under 25,000 people for a population. That's what we consider kind of small here um, in Texas. Um, and we really work with them to understand their options for preservation, you know, preservation, capital P, um, kind of what Norm said, freezing things in time is just one option of preservation. And it's also a limiting option, which you also touched on. Um, and so we talk to 
everybody, you know, we talk to landowners, we talk to everybody from, um, yeah, about their preservation, about the need for preservation, and about the different flavors that can um, come up in the need for preserving your spaces and structures. And I like to work specifically in rural areas and in smaller jurisdictions and really where places um, where the conversation around land ownership and policy come to a pretty strong head. I find those that those places um, challenge policy in a way that can often come out and be more creative, you know, not every time, but very often those places tend to, you know, like I said, they might not want a district, but they're willing to do a form-based node for some reason. You know, I don't know how their brains are making the jump, but that's um, often some, some of the outcomes. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, in my spare time, I volunteer with some preservation organizations. Um, preservation Austin is a favorite of mine. Um, and I teach remotely at Tumble University, teaching intro to urban planning classes. So um, I, I feel like I really live and breathe this, <laughs> this realm of planning. <laughs> Well, and I, I love that you touched on like that the policies give rise to these challenges and maybe to back away out of that in sort of the higher level, like what are some of the core principles uh, that really should guide a community when it looks at updating its heritage preservation policies or grappling with these these uh, challenging questions? Such a good question. So um, in my response to that first, I always want to encourage everyone to understand on a level playing field what preservation means and what it historically has been. So historically preservation has meant that we're going to restrict new things from coming in. And there's a specific time period or look and feel um, that we want to maintain and not change. Um, and so that's, that's a very, you know, Western perspective of preservation. There's more to places than just their buildings, right? There's people, there's business, there's stories, there's, I don't know, sky and air and light and sounds and everything is different. Um, so first I start by having us understand, you know, what is in a very traditional sense, what is the scope of preservation in this place? And a lot of places are like, well, we've had, I think this was the case in the um, podcast that you sent over as well, but um, usually we get like a, well, we have had this landmark sort of in place for 30, 50 years, maybe even more. Um, and everything around it is looking like crap and it even doesn't look that great, you know, and everyone is like, we've put this preservation on it and nothing was preserved. What happened? And so then we go from, okay, you've preserved this, but let's look at the actual structures by which you are preserving this. And that's when we really get into what is your preservation ordinance saying? Oh, you don't have a preservation ordinance? Okay, well, that's step one. Oh, you've never had a conversation about, you know, materials and you don't know, you know, there's nothing on your books about um, maintenance of like brick masonry versus maybe a, in Texas, we have really soft limestone masonry. So, and those are very different practices of maintenance. So we really get into the nitty gritty of, okay, what are all the structures that have affected, not just this place of preservation, but also your perspective of the way that we preserve. Um, I think that answers your yeah, question. No, I love it. And yeah, okay. I mean, it, it really stands out because we have these, uh, you know, James Howard Kunstler's uh, The Geography of Nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we have these like five over one, like commercial with residential on top, sort of like block yes. buildings that are like popping up everywhere. And people are like, why is this looking exactly the same as it does elsewhere? And so there's a, a response to that. And in the podcast that um, I shared with Meredith, the one of the hosts made a great point that like, hey, it used to be that heritage preservation meant stopping entire blocks or neighborhoods from being demolished. And now it's become in some of our communities, like really sort of really refined. And it's almost the fine art of preserving a balcony railing rather than like the broader sense of like, what is the scope of a, a heritage place? And so as a follow-up, uh, what are some of the types of things that can typically or really derail a well-intentioned heritage preservation effort? Um, yeah, I get this question a lot. Well, actually, I don't get this question a lot. I think I get a lot of, well, we tried, insert list of things that I'm about to give you. Uh, 
and then they're like, but nothing happened. So, um, and I wrote down the list. So usually, um, usually it's a lot of, um, we want to create an entire district, not a landmark, but we want to create an entire district and not everyone has had buy-in or we want to create an entire district and the language that we're using is really exclusionary. Um, and those are usually the two kind of like ways that we see these efforts falter. Um, I also think that jumping straight into we want to create a district really misses all your other options that you've just like jumped beyond in order to get to we want to get a district, right? Um, I usually ask like, have you had a, con again, have you had a conversation about like appropriate maintenance for your historic materials? Have you had gone through the identification process of what are your historic materials? How are you treating legacy businesses? You know, do you have legacy businesses? Um, yeah, there's I, just the entire network of digging into not just this place is old, we need to preserve it, but get into also this place has meaning and who is it for? I also really strongly encourage places to map every place that they've, you know, had new housing and every place that has been preserved and look at the differences. Um, not just not just physically, but also demographics. Um, and then start to figure out, you know, what, I mean, a lot of times these maps are related to older maps, um, especially with larger cities here in the US, oftentimes when you start to overlay the, the existing zoning map with the um, district map, with the targeted infill map, you get a redlining map. Um, and that and that's really kind of hard to swallow. So we often ask folks to map their own efforts and see where the gaps are. OK, if you've had a district that has been targeted for a lot of growth, but the growth isn't sensitive, you know, examine the district and understand who is there, what is there. And then also we often <laughs> we often ask cities to assess for the type of history that they're preserving, which is an, again another really really challenging conversation to have. Like I said, I'm working in small town Texas, and I can tell you I've been called every name in the book for bringing this kind of stuff up. Um, but it's very important to have a conversation around whose history is actually being preserved predominantly in this jurisdiction and whose history has been missed. And then I think bridging the gaps between your policies is really part of kind of mending the gap of preservation there. That was a well, long answer. Yeah, no, I love it. And it brings to mind an experience that Meredith and I had of meeting with oh, yeah. um, uh, Dr. Sylvia Biddle-Patton, who is the head of the Cherry Neighborhood Association in Charlotte. Uh, I was around the time of CNU and she took us on a whirlwind tour of their neighborhood, a uh, predominantly black neighborhood, historically always so. And within that setting, she said, here are several locations where we knew that there were churches or meeting places for people to gather for worship and where they would also uh, bury their dead. And yet those places are not marked or those places are not recognized or they're only like referred to in sort of like stories and not actually recognized um, within the, the landscape of like the city's own uh, efforts to preserve history and to the point where there was a, a theater that was built right on the top of what was known to be a cemetery. And in that setting, there's this, I mean, the cemeteries are so interesting because there's an enduring legacy of sa sacralized space. And the question of, well, who is it sacred for? And what does mm -hmm. it mean to sort of bear witness uh, to those uh, to those stories but and the people as well as at times, like, does this then lock us into a situation where there's no capacity to desacralize the space and, and do something different with it? And I think it's within that setting, like what is the value in heritage preservation? Like how do you convince the the, the people in suits uh, that they should really care about, you know, that there's a value whether economic or social or otherwise? Yeah, again, another really great question that we just get asked all the time, especially and especially by planners, you know, and I'm not I'm a planner, too. So it took a lot of unlearning in my brain to figure some of this stuff out. So, um, you know, there's the obvious things. There's tourism. Um, there's development pressure or, you know, development appeasement. Everything is a lot nicer and maybe more attractive when you put it into, maybe that's my bias, but I think things are more attractive when they're packaged in historic structures. Um, but, you know, we also have to acknowledge that historic spaces are essentially the existing version of what like CNU or like Strong Towns is like promoting. 
Um, so, you know, these older, these older neighborhoods were not necessarily designed around cars. They have like narrow, narrow driveways or narrow um, driving lanes. Um, maybe they have different like development patterns or placement patterns on the site. Maybe they even have, you know, we get this a lot in Texas is a lot of these structures were built on large acre sites. And then they had traditionally a lot of informal buildings around them that served as like storage or pop-up shops or even housing. Um, and so we get this pattern of development that we can really extract from historic neighborhoods. And I think I think looking backwards and like finding some of the evidence, you know, finding the maps or like an original plat map of like how the land was divided and used um, is so crucial. And you'll notice on, I don't, this is silly of me, but I don't know if they have Sanborn maps in Canada. Maybe they do. Um, okay, they don't. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, well, not good, but the, the Sanborn maps in America um, were insurance maps, fire insurance maps, and they're fabulous because they not only illustrate how things are located, you know, how siting occurred, but also the materials, the use, the units, the mix of units, the, the people who live there, the number of people. And when you cross correlate that to census data, historic census data, you can start to see how multi-generational living was already built into historic housing and that mixed use structures already existed, even in, um, there's a gentleman with a farmhouse in his background here. And so, you know, even that structure can offer mixed use, even though it's in this sort of rural pristine environment. Yes, yes, we love an atlas. Oh my gosh, I want to flip through it. <laughs> if I unblurred my background, you would see that it's basically a trash collection of like atlases and stained glass that I've taken out of demolished buildings. So, um, So yes, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, I think a lot of times planners really think that they're starting from scratch. And again, not to call anyone out. I'm a planner too. I get this. We think we're starting from scratch. We see Seaside and we're like, it's never been done. Yeah, it's never been done that way, but it actually has been done. And we have to really, again, step away from whatever it is, the blockage that's there and see that things already exist. And often I'll even add this, often they exist better and function better in communities of color because they were so forced to not interact with the white community around them that you get extremely dense living, extremely walkable neighborhoods, really open to like different types of housing, different types of commercial spacing. Um, but we don't have those on record most of the time. So again, looking at, looking at that historic data to help us plan for the future, I think is really crucial. Yeah. And it's, it's to be able to identify that as like just a regular part of human habitation. Um, my mm -hmm. brother-in-law, Mitch wrote a great blog post with a great title of like a neighborhood full of illegals. And he's describing yeah. the types of housing that are, you know, there's the walk-up apartment, there's the small little backyard dwelling, there's the duplex that's right in the midst of like a couple of single family homes. There's a few, like there's a four story house. There's like different sort of components and they're all, except for the, you know, the handful of single family homes, all the rest were removed basically or wiped off the map in terms of allowances or permit uh, permits to do so because it was yeah. like, no, we need to down zone this or uh, remove the capacity for this. And I, I love yeah. what you're describing of like, we've got to peel back those layers. And I think that that is so critical also from it's, you can't do that from a top-down perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. It is really difficult to sort of map the whole world uh, or map the whole country mm -hmm. or map even the whole region, but from a block by block by block level, maybe this is a, a, a you know, we've got wonderful folks that are on, on the call today. Is yeah. there something that you would recommend like someone that's like, Hey, I'm kind of an amateur historian. Like what, what, what do they bring to the table? What is something that oh my gosh, uh, a yes. person can do to be like, to galvanize a community around these ideas? Okay. So again, a, a incredible question. <laughs> um, I absolutely love an amateur historian who wants to do the research on their place. You know, passion is not something that you can curate yeah. Or, you know, like it's there or it's not there. You can't like build it. So to have someone who is so passionate about their place um, and we're actually working with a community here in Texas. It's a little town called Liberty Hill. Um, my dad lives there. It's a cute little place. Um, and they've, you know, their history has predominantly been framed as 
pioneer history, early settlers of Texas, you know, they're, they're um, in this huge, like almanac about like settlement in central Texas and what life was like, and it's hard. And, you know, that's a really significant point of history. But what we found on the ground was that people didn't really relate to it. Um, and what we actually found was this huge collection of amateur historians who actually ended up to be like, I think everyone who was 40 and up <laughs> was not probably in this group. Um, and they had basically dedicated their lives, not just time, but like whole buildings. This guy's whole house is dedicated to just artifacts from the 60s through the 90s of Liberty Hill because they had had such a huge artistic like explosion in their town. And it was actually an international artistic explosion. They have like sculptures from Italy and like Germany and like people came to train there in this like masonry practice that again is no longer existing because their codes didn't require like any type of like maintenance so like there's there's so much space for amateur historians and one of the things that I always tell people or remind them I guess is that like the national standard in America is that history is 50 years old so you just have to meet that 50 year mark, right? I know you guys are like, what? Um, you just have to meet that 50 year mark. And that's in the seventies now. You know how much cool stuff happened in the seventies that people are saying like, oh, we can't preserve it because our time period in history is 1880. Like that is such an unrelatable time period for so many people and so many people who have stories that they want to share. I think updating and opening yourself up to not just bigger time periods, you know, 50 years, um, but different types of history. Like I said, that sort of not just frozen in place, Western style of preservation, but storytelling, music, food, dance, gathering, like use of space can be history. That's what I would say. Yeah. How do you see a way for smaller communities in particular to access funding? to maybe mm. subsidize the work that property owners need to do to keep up their buildings, or in some cases take over old buildings or create the conditions necessary for their thriving. I'm about to go, I have to drop off in a moment here to drive yeah. out to Chilliwack where in the downtown, there's like, an, there's a ve the veganist like um, grocer is in an old, old building. It's not, I mean, old by West Coast standards. Uh, it's just a modest two-story structure right in the downtown. Um, but I did the property, like a value per acre mapping for it compared yeah. to the like big box superstore. And that store pays seven or five times as much in property taxes per acre that the de the big super uh, store does. And yet they, the owner of that building um, almost assuredly had to fight tooth and nail for even a scrap of funding to be able to help with like, updating it and, and keeping it up to code and as well as trying to maintain some of the historical features like masonry for example if there's mason a um, certain type of masonry you can't just stick up hardy board or you mm -hmm. do it and then you ask for forgiveness afterwards which is not mm -hmm. a good approach to historic preservation um how what are some strategies i guess like is there hope is it um are there arms of government or private foundations that are funding this like who's got money for this <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, who's got money for anything these days? I think that's, again, such a great question. Um, we're all feeling the pressure, but I, I don't want to sidestep the question, but I do want to shift the focus slightly a little bit. So I think that one of the, one of the barriers that we tend to spend a lot of time sort of breaking down in conversation with communities is that things have to be done perfectly and that it's only preservation if you do it right the first time. It's only preservation if you can replace that window in kind, one for one replacement, or it's only preservation if, I don't know, this Victorian structure is never touched and never painted a different color. And yes, those are types of preservation, absolutely, yes. But preservation is also occupying a structure that is over 50 years old. And I think if we shift some of our mindset about what it means to preserve, and if we maybe lower the bar a little bit, you know, have some light and fresh air standards and then give them a TCO and like open a business, please. Um, that's what I think would generate more activity and would help kind of bridge that gap between the loss of generated funding in that historic downtown versus the funding that's generated beyond that historic downtown. And I think there's, you know, 
I don't know. I there's funding, but I don't want to say that it's available. <laughs> it's it is technically available. It has gotten extremely competitive to apply for grants, and that's just a matter of fact. So if you don't have a really, really, really strong case, or if you're not fitting into that grant structure really nice and square, you're really running like the risk there. So apply for everything, expect nothing is what I always say. And so with that in mind, I want us to really focus on, you know, maintenance is cheaper than replacing. So like train your city staff and help them go downtown and perform maintenance tasks on buildings that, you know, the owner allows you to do. Um, If you're gonna like take off like bio growth on a masonry structure on one building, you might as well do it for its neighbor too. That's kind of the thinking. Um, The other thing is that maintenance is kind of this big scary word. It's hard to spell. It's a lot of word, but it's the main thing that we're honestly lacking is training for the maintenance. And so instead of thinking that we need something new or, you know, oh, we're competing with I don't know, like the new Walmart, again, like reframing, we're not competing with them. We're, we're supporting this. We're focusing here. We're not trying to compete with them. Walmart's going to exist and the sprawl is going to serve a population. It just does. And it will, but we want to focus on this. And instead of it being a competition between the two, acknowledge the value and grow the value in ways that are accessible. Um, I, I'm going to harp on maintenance forever. <laughs> probably until I die but um the other thing is that like change is really normal for historic places and I think especially in my like absolute love is historic downtown so I really love the Main Street program I don't know if there's a version or if it extends up into Canada um if there's not or if it doesn't I strongly recommend looking into Main Street because their approach is really broad it captures like a holistic system rather than, you know, one building at a time kind of thing. It um, addresses a lot of systematic issue. But again, I think the real gap is coming between planners and preservationists sort of speaking past each other. Yeah. yeah. And I, I will also say like, there are, if you have less sensitivity in a place like your downtown where we can map that, the differences between um, the costs and the income and the revenue, then altering your zoning code to allow for that place to be built up and making it easier for it to be built up in that area will, will directly compete with the Walmart, you know, it's going to be, yeah, yeah, the numbers don't lie. Yeah. And yeah, I I just think there's so much in there. And if we can allow (laughs) many of these places to like earn their own keep, but not in like a prejudiced or sort of like impossible way. And some of that is addressing some of the imbalances between the way that we assess properties, the way that we like derive, you know, a suitable property tax sort of uh, scheme. And I mean, it's stunning the gaps between like what we expect of our downtowns and versus like the low standards that we have for um, sort of all of the new development that is is underperforming. I mean, that's Strong Towns Lingo 101. Um, I'm going to have to switch seats and become a spectator. And in a moment, I'm going to be uh, <laughs> dialing in as I'm driving out to an event. Um, but Carly is going to take over. And we're sort of at a point, too, where we can um, pivot a little bit as well. If for those that are on the call, if you want to jump in, you've got questions for Meredith or, um, uh, yeah, certainly the questions that uh, got get posted in the chat, all of that. Uh, we'll go from there. Meredith, this has been awesome. And I can't wait for the next 30 minutes. Uh, over to you, Carly. <laughs> Thanks, Norm. Bye. I have not oh. been reading the comments in the chat, so you're good. I I am trying okay. to keep track of them, and I think we're we're cool. really we're gonna be on top of them. I am gonna ask Greg awesome. in a second if he wants to ask a question, but I wanted cool. to ask a question. You know, one of the things I know we wanted to ask you is the the overlap that you see between the work of strong towns and the work of preservation, and and when you were talking about um, maintenance. Uh, that was something like I could hear Chuck's voice in my head talking about like how we need to maintain what we have. And so I, I just wanted to hear kind of, you know, your journey about how you found Strong Towns and where you see overlap and, you know, maybe a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of coaching for all of us who are Strong Towns believers and allies, like how we can also be preservationists. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I found, I feel like I was, 
early indoctrinated into strong towns. I think I found y'all in college maybe in 2010 or 12 or something like that. Um, and then I saw Chuck speak for the first time, I think at CNU Detroit. And that was also the first time I had ever sat in on a conversation where planners were talking about building code and the correlation between zoning code and building code. And in my brain, I was like, well, holy cow, that's a new door I didn't even know existed. Um, so first of all, I think reading your code and understand, you know, asking yourself, how does this play out in historic places is one of the first ways to kind of get in, in the mindset of a planner preservationist. With my, um, when I did teach in person, with my um, grad students, we did a project every year where we would find a historic neighborhood. Usually this was in Philly, so they usually lived in historic neighborhoods. So it was easy to say like, use your own address, um, but pick an address and then do, you know, just, you can draw this by hand just using little like blocks or something, um, but do the comparison of what's, you know, what's the existing context, that historic context, and then what's allowed by right. And usually you end up with a block that's like this and a block that's like this. And you realize like this would never be allowed. But then I also have them add in all of the like bonuses. So you can get like the FAR bonus, the Florida area ratio bonus. If you like, I don't know, add a green roof on your 70th floor or something like that. So then we end up getting buildings that are like all the way here and this one's over here. So it's really helpful again to understand the way that your historic places are treated in the base zoning, because if we're not going to treat them right in the initial conversation, then it's gonna be really hard to build up a strong enough band-aid through a district or an overlay to make them like high quality places and to really affect preservation. So I think understanding your code, having conversations about tax credits, you know, 38 states have a state tax credit. So having just, even having the link on your planning, city's planning website about a tax credit or, you know, the link to the state, the state historic preservation office and just start a dialogue, I think is one of the first ways that I would, I would start doing that. And then walk around your downtown, you know, when the, maybe some of the businesses suck and I get that, I get that not every small town has a stellar downtown in this particular moment. I've walked through a lot of dusty, crusty antique shops and like, I don't know, just a lot of stuff. Um, I get that, but this is one of the first times and possibly one of the only times that you'll be allowed in the structure. So go in and look at the structure see what's going on in it. How is it being maintained? Do you see water damage? Ask questions of the business owner if they're around. You know, do you rent, do you own? Are you close with the building owner? Start inviting the building owner to have like a conversation. I think these really slow conversations are the way to go. And I, I uh, Norm asked earlier, you know, what's a common mistake that I see? And I think it's just jumping straight into, we want to have a district. You can you can know that as your goal or that it's potentially one of your options when you get to the end of the conversation line. But I think having a conversation first about, you know, why aren't you preserving or why are you preserving is going to be more helpful. Great. Um, so I want to see, um, one of the first questions that we got was from Greg, who's on the call yeah. and he lives in yeah. Trinidad, Tr Trinidad, Colorado. Um, awesome. and it looks like they have a, a, quite a few historic buildings on their main street that awesome. are struggling, you know, to, uh, maintain. So Greg, do you want to tell us a little more about that in context and maybe a couple of pieces of, ask for a couple of pieces of advice from Meredith, perhaps? Oh. Um. <laughs> I I can see a lot of advantage in preserving your history by by maintaining these buildings. A lot of people don't look at the building maintenance part. They look at restoring the facade. But mm -hmm. if the rest of the building's not in very good shape, that doesn't help you a whole lot. Yeah. And we also have quite a few buildings that the structure itself is not in very good shape. Yeah. And I think 
over time, we're losing more and more of these buildings. And I, I think it's good to preserve at least a few of them as examples, but there's some I think you just have to let go because they've gone too far. When I talk to private owners, though, of these buildings, a lot of times they have no access to any capital. Banks don't lend them money. Some of them have checked with 30 and 40 different banks all over the country, and they have never been able to get financing, even though they're not people of, you know, they're not poor, they're not unable to provide funding themselves, but getting into historic preservation is, I think, very scary for banks. They just don't like it very much. That's actually a great point. Really Meredith, point. have you had any experience and ex yes. exposure or any, uh, any ability to convince banks? <laughs> I've no, I have never successfully convinced a bank to fund anything. So <laughs> that's just a period across the board. Um, it's not my strong suit. Um, but what you're bringing up is such a good point. And, you know, of, I think that is just so grounded and based in reality of what our smaller jurisdictions and cities that have never received large amounts of funding, cities that had highways put through the middle of them and it, you know, derailed any type of growth. Even neighborhoods that have historically been people of color experience this every day. Um, so yes, this is a very real thing. And what I often tell these communities, especially if it, I don't wanna to read too far into it, but especially when communities feel like these buildings are already lost. I encourage documentation first and foremost, as much as you can, you know, the different types of documentation, stories about the building, photographs of the building, any kind of histor historic like drawings, material samples, you know, as much of the building as you can if it's not going to be saved. And I think that is a really important part. Again, it's sad and we can mourn the loss of the structure, but we we also know that sometimes things have to go. Um, and so again, if you can't find any way to save it, document it. And then um, I think there's so much to be extracted from the exterior and the place, just the general place of a historic downtown. I think we can extract architectural styles, we can extract scale, we can extract placement, um, we can extract, you know, how, <laughs> where do doors go, you know, on a corner building? Do they always have a door on the primary corner? Do they also have a secondary door? You know, there's so much detail that we can extract and then apply in a different way. Um, in a project right now, we are ex we went through and we extracted that level of detail from the historic downtown, and they want to create sort of a secondary downtown that attaches to that historic downtown. Um, and so instead of recreating the same architecture, we're helping them to understand the siting and how the actual environment down to light posts and seasonal plants that you have not the not the perennials but just the annuals down to the annuals um how that can enhance the walkability all of the historic aspects that they really really like about that downtown without recreating and trying to redo a historic piece of architecture if that makes sense so i think extracting the information that's there document it extract the information that it provides and then don't try to reconstruct it. That's kind of a cardinal rule of preservation is we don't like to, you know, when the Notre Dame burned, we don't want to reconstruct it the exact same way. We want to put a different kind of flair on it or pay homage to the, the experience that the building had. So Meredith, we got a lot of questions. It's great. Oh, um, no, and this is this is great. We're just taking off. Um, I think Mr. RL, I don't know your first name, but um, he raised his hand. So we're going to go to him, then Charlie, mm -hmm. and then Danny has okay. a great question. Cool. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, uh, two, two thoughts here that start with Greg's great thought of bringing up about 
uh, the small little old property owners or the small the, prop, the owners of the small little properties can't afford anything anymore. Boy, that's that's for sure. One thing you might and banks. One thing, and I do have some background in this. One thing in your community. Look for the bank that is local or at least had a local connection to begin with, even if it maybe has been bought out or whatever, because let's face it, the, the PR is great and they're always looking for PR. They also might have uh, people who are into the soul of the place because they may be local residents. But uh, now, obviously it gets really tough for the property owners these days to even be able to you know, qualify. But if that bank were situated or connected with, say, we have a downtown foundation, and and or if there's a really strong organization that doesn't get questioned about, you know, are you shaky? Are you going to survive or whatever? Um, they could be a link between a bank and a, a fund, so to speak, for exactly maintenance. Wow, I this I this whole show blows my mind. I love it. So <laughs> there's one thought to at least look at because of it being possible, I think it is possible that the funds are out there and connecting it with the the uh, uh, hard pressed property owner. Number two, in our community, um, permitting income is just, it probably all around the country, but yeah. cities are just completely looking to survive wherever they can on adding permitting fees for everything. And one thing we're struggling with, we've been hit really hard with is downtown parking, Consequently, the maintenance, the, the contractors who are doing maintenance are being required to buy parking permits. And it's completely, the, the level of detail it gets crazy and it becomes near impossible for them to even deal because the process has become Frankensteinian, Estonian, in terms of just going and getting the permits if they just want to go by for two hours to repair an emergency. And there's no parking in front, crazy. So, and also those costs then are passed on to, to, to the property owners. So there's, I'm not, there's no answer at that point uh, to, to, to this, but it's just one more blockade to maintenance. So yeah, great topic. you're you. so right with this. And this is why I really like strongly believe in that main street. I don't network. I don't know. In Texas, it is part of, a city so there's a main street department and i know in other places it's often a standalone like 501c3 that has a relationship with the city so that's a really different look um in some of the larger jurisdictions where i've worked i've noticed that they will create kind of like you said like a business association for like a neighborhood or something like that and those businesses will then be responsible for paying for the things that they find value in and those are often things that well not often usually like in philadelphia which is the example i'm thinking of it's annoying things that are actually really necessary for the business to run like trash removal those are things that actually hinder the business because that's an additional cost of membership plus paying for the, the trash removal that needs to be paid for anyway so that doesn't make sense but paying for something like shared parking that's exclusively used for you know employees or maintenance or people working on your building that makes more sense having a pot of funding that everyone can contribute to and use because maybe all your buildings are connected on a single row that makes a lot of sense one structure is connected to another um i think there are you're so right i don't have a good example and i don't know or a good answer and i don't know if there is a good solution there um, but I think some of the creativity of like, how can we create sources of funding that are available for common shared problems that we're all going to, you know, experience and have a cause and effect from. To me, that's one of the things that we've seen work in, in some smaller jurisdictions if there's enough activity. You also mentioned the permitting fee. That's a big one. Um, usually preservation permitting fees are free in order to encourage people to actually use them, um, which is great. Yeah, we love that. More of that. Right. Um, 
And Charlie asked a question in the chat. Yeah. How do you promote preservation in a community without falling into the trap of the overly prescriptive requirements that inhibit creative reuse? And you you spoke to that a little bit, but if you can, you know, talk about what are some strategies that that people like us can use to help, you know, our, our elected officials and others understand how how preservation I'll say should work. Yeah, um, I I think talking about your history in a way that you know isn't isn't just like oh we were founded by this guy at this time. Like talking about history, inviting people downtown, holding events in these historic places, asking for opportunities to host in those places. I think generally drawing the attention to those places is a way that everybody can be a preservationist. You know, I I even tell like kids who, who are dragged to our events, like tell your mom, like your favorite restaurant is downtown. Like this is where you want to be eating. They have the best dessert and they often do. It's all butter. Um, but these are places, you know, that's a very low barrier to entry for those of us who maybe even don't live downtown, but really want to support downtown. Um, start having like your birthday parties downtown. Start having, you know, like your weekly coffee walk downtown, something like that. And then ask about buildings. Ask your city or, you know, your leadership, like, tell me about this building. Oh, you don't have information on it. Let's get you the information. Make it available to everybody. I think so much about under relating to history is hearing history and I think also relating to it on a broader scale which is why I say don't start with just like the we were founded on this day in 1842 um like those are hard to relate to but hearing someone say you know oh that building used to be where like my mom would get all of our groceries and now I don't know, now it's an antique shop. Like that's really shocking for a lot of people. And then the next step, maybe you could have like a farmer's market pop up in front of that building and remind people like, oh yeah, we could totally get our groceries here. Um, and again, it's going to be a select amount of people who are going to go there. So, or, you know, for that example specifically. So I think you have to really key into what's going to make your community really tick and engage on that. And it's different for everybody. I also, again, this goes back to kind of the hard conversations that we have at the very early beginning of most of our projects, but asking, you know, okay, we've heard the history that you've got on the books. What about people of color? What about women in your history? Where's the LGBTQ history? So making it much more inclusive to say, you know, yes, these people exist and we're going to talk about them. Open up your city council meeting with, you know, an anecdote from someone's like historic diary of some sort, you know, like there's a lot of different ways, I think, to bring it up. Um, and I think you really have to choose the flavor that's going to work for your community. That's great. Um, okay. <laughs> Danny, do you want to add? I I saw that you asked for the the assignment, which I think is great. Which I think we should we should all Meredith, you should assign that to all of us for homework. Uh, but I think <laughs> I if it's something that. you'd be willing to share, Danny, did you want to Absolutely. ask a question about that? Or or well, we I mean, that was just it for explicitly that reason. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. I mean, like I was, you know, I I do a lot of the academy courses on strong towns, and it's like. I think one of the ones that's very similar to what you were describing was the like, hey, go go do the math on the cost analysis versus the mm -hmm. big box store in the downtown. And I think that that assignment would be very tangible for someone who's, you know, very much an amateur to just get an idea and then, you know, go to the people I've made connections with and say, hey, what? look at this. I, I did this yeah. little thing. You can too, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. And doing um, like comparison studies too, you know, finding, I, I do this a lot again for smaller jurisdictions. They're always like, we're the only ones with this problem. We're the only ones who have this issue. And that's fine. I get that. So we bring in a few other examples of similarly sized jurisdictions or jurisdictions with similar like political environments and things like that. 
again, pretty easy to do in central Texas where I predominantly work. Um, but we say like, okay, they were able to, you know, utilize their preservation in this way, for example, affordable housing. Um, what's enough? Can you do that here? Like, let's look at this policy. Can you see how it applies and kind of walk them through the different ways? Um, yeah, I think that's great. I'll also say, um, not to toot my own horn, but a little toot toot. Um, I did the historic preservation for urban planners class on planetism. Um, and that, I think that most of their classes are really fabulous. I know when I first started as a planner, um, I watched like religiously all of their videos during and after school and like extremely helpful. Same thing with the Strong Towns courses. What, what was that website again? Sorry. It's called. I'll type. I'll type okay. It. <laughs> okay. And I'll thank try you, to find. You. I'll thank try you. to find the website while we're while uh, Meredith is talking. Um, Meredith, we have about six minutes left. Yes. I don't see any active um, questions in the chat, but I wanted you to, if you could, uh, give a give a little bit of an overview of of you know the your thoughts on the tension that we're seeing now with housing availability and historic preservation, um, because I know housing, you may know, others may know that's the topic of Chuck's book that's coming out this spring, but it's a hot issue in really every community in North America. And so if you can talk about how your your work is informed by that and, and you know how you're trying to help communities in their quest for historic preservation and, help, and available housing. Yeah, absolutely. great question. Um, so I, I think I already mentioned this, but historic communities come equipped with a lot of the tools that combat affordable housing or, you know, provide for affordable housing, we'll say. They often come with, you know, more than one living unit, which usually not allowed in single family. That's the definition. Um, they're usually allowing for, they're usually encouraging maintenance versus replacement. So when we Usually, I said, um, when we're looking at the housing options, we're often adding to a historic house rather than demolishing and restarting, which is great. That helps keep costs lower. Um, and then most of the time in our, and I think this is maybe a big hurdle, but a lot of time in our historic housing neighborhoods, there was no difference between like classes, like the middle class was not quite invented yet by the time for most of our historic housing neighborhoods. And that's why we see such an integration of housing. So I think acknowledging that not only are these neighborhoods denser, more walkable, have more opportunities for a mix of uses, but they're also already equipped with affordable housing kind of built in and a pattern of affordable housing kind of already laid, I think that's a really helpful starting point. And one example that I'll give is the city of San Antonio, which is a large city, I, too big for me, wouldn't work there, um, wouldn't consult there, I'll say. Um, but they have really taken the approach that their historic neighborhoods that are smaller houses are preserved, but in a way that they are affordable. And so they've created this entire system of material reclamation and reusing those materials in those neighborhoods because it is one for one, you know, material compatibility. Um, and then they also train contractors and certify them in, in deconstruction and material replacement. And those contractors basically have guaranteed jobs to work in those neighborhoods. So you can see kind of the building out of the system, plus they've changed their zoning code in a lot of ways to allow for these different types of housing um, to occur. And they've allowed for more historic materials to be allowed, um, specifically like earthen building materials, which are common here in like the South and the Southwest. Um, so I think those are some of the ways that preservation can assist with providing housing. But I'm, I mean, I'm sure you've picked up already. I'm not going to defend the history that preservation has and the way that it's been utilized. I think that's the reason we're having this conversation to begin with. Um, and I'm not going to defend the use of preservation in that way. Um, I 
personally can't think of very many instances where I would say preservation is more important than housing, especially in this current climate. I just can't. But I will say, <laughs> but one, I will say, you know, when we talk about affordable housing and the need for more growth, we look at historic neighborhoods in one in one facet, and that's true. But I think that we also need to apply the same critical examination to our zoning codes and ensure that they're actually living up to our expectations for the ability to build actual affordable housing, not market rate. I'm, I, I feel very frustrated when I listen to an argument for demolishing a historic structure for market rate housing. I find that to be a little challenging to swallow. Um, so looking at, you know, integrated housing, looking at housing that allows for a diverse income, diverse incomes to be able to afford to live there, housing that's walkable, close to jobs, housing that provides quality of life. Um, yeah, I think our zoning codes have a long way to go before, you know, we really need to be harping on preservation in a lot of the ways that we often do. But my stance is pretty strong in, in that way. Right. Okay, it looks like we have about one minute left. So yes, what, be before, short. before we uh, before we say thank you and conclude, I did want to ask, um, do you have any blogs or podcasts you'd recommend or any other materials that you um, would like for people or would recommend people dig into? Oh my gosh. Um, so there's, I actually thought about this right before the interview and I will send you a list of sources who I recommend. I'm big on like Instagram. <laughs> That's I'm a millennial. I'm a 30 year old millennial. So like I'm stuck in one mode. So I'll send you the Instagrams that I follow where I feel like I'm learning. Um, and then I also, you know, I, yeah, I do a lot of reading. I can also share the syllabi that I put together for some of the courses that I teach as well. That would be wonderful. That would be great. Cool. Um, well, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining our office hours. And of course, thanks um, most to Meredith Johnson. Um, we appreciate your time. And yes, I'll, I'll join Danny. We appreciate your time and your information. It was all really wonderful. And thanks to Norm for kicking us off. Um, and we'll be back soon uh, with the next edition of Office Hours. I'm sure Norm will be in touch with each of you and we'll work to um, get you the follow-up resources. So thank you all for joining us and I hope everybody has a great afternoon and weekend. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Take care, yeah. thanks. Bye guys. Bye-bye.